This is the Humanist Report with Mike Figueredo. Sponsored by Amazon, Audible, HostGator, Gamefly, and supporters of independent media like you. Welcome to the Humanist Report. My name is Mike Figueredo, and this is the 39th episode of the podcast. And today's episode is brought to you by our latest member on Patreon. Today we have Katie Sharko, and then we also received a donation from Thai Ruos with the message stating, Keep up the fight, Mike. It's not over. So absolutely, you can best believe that I will continue to fight for Bernie Sanders and progressive values. Now, a great update for the show. We are now officially on iTunes, so you can subscribe to that and get the audio version of the podcast. And additionally, if you would like to download full episodes of the MP3s of the podcast, you can do that on SoundCloud now. So all the links will be down below in the description box. So on today's episode, I'll be talking about the New York election fraud and give you guys an update on that. Now additionally, I'll discuss how voting issues in Rhode Island and California will most likely hurt Bernie Sanders. Now additionally, Hillary Clinton thinks that Sanders supporters will unite behind her. So I'm going to talk about that and whether or not she's right. Now furthermore, Donald Trump defends transgender rights and he gets attacked by Ted Cruz because of that. So I'll actually come to Donald Trump's defense in this episode, unbelievably so. Now, furthermore, another issue I want to talk about is Bill Maher and how he argued that we should strip churches of their tax-exempt status, and Elizabeth Warren demolished Ted Cruz. And finally, Joe Biden defended Bernie Sanders and the criticisms that he received. So all of these topics and more will be talked about in today's episode. So stay tuned. I hope you guys enjoy the podcast. So we already know that Bernie Sanders lost New York by about 16 points, but the thing that makes me really disappointed is that we'll never know how this state would have turned out if, one, it was an open primary, or two, if there just wasn't rampant voting fraud across the state. Now, there were a plethora of shenanigans that went on, just to name a few here. Exit polls were way off by about 11 points, when in actuality, it showed that Bernie Sanders only lost by about 5 points, and furthermore, polling stations were down in some areas in in their entirety. There wasn't even one polling station that was working. Now, furthermore, uh, at this point, we don't even know if provisional ballots are going to be counted. Uh, That is pending a court decision. So, who knows at this point? Uh, and furthermore, the locations of polling places was switched at the last minute. Now, besides that, we have voter purging in Brooklyn. So according to Gothamist, 44,000 voters were inactive, 70,000 were removed from the inactive list, and 12,000 people had been moved out of the borough. So I'll get to why uh, this was the case later on and give you an update on that. But now I want to give you an update on the situation, just generally speaking. So as of now, it's official that the attorney general... Uh, Eric Schneiderman has officially launched an investigation. He states, I am deeply troubled by the volume and consistency of voting irregularities, both in public reports and direct complaints to my office's voter hotline, which received more than 1,000 complaints in the course of the day yesterday. That's why today we have opened an investigation into alleged improprieties in yesterday's voting by the New York City Board of Elections. If necessary, we will initiate inquiries in additional areas of the state where voting irregularities appeared unusually high. Now, furthermore, according to the Huffington Post, New York City Comptroller Scott Stringer announced on Tuesday that he would audit the Board of Elections. Mayor Bill de Blasio described what had happened as a purge and said the errors indicated the board needs major reforms. Now, at face value, this may sound good, right? Well, if you're expecting impartiality, you're probably not going to get that because Stringer here is a delegate for Hillary Clinton, who is going to be investigating fraud that disproportionately benefited Hillary Clinton. So, (laughs) this is a joke. Uh, I don't know what the status is about the New York Attorney General, but I really hope that we could take him at his word that he actually is going to take this seriously. Now, the official who was actually guilty of purging the voters has been fired. Uh, So, her name is Diane Haslett Rudiano, and she was the Board of Elections chief clerk, and she was a, and she was suspended, quote, 
without pay effective immediately pending an internal investigation into the administration of the voters' rolls in the borough of Brooklyn. Now, New York Daily News explains the problems began when she was trying to clean up the voting books, which must be periodically purged to eliminate people who die, move, or are ineligible for other reasons. Sources said she skipped one of the steps that was built in to stop the system from purging eligible voters, which caused a chain reaction that led to people being improperly removed. So at this point, it seems as though we can chalk this up to incompetence, but at the same time, part of me wants to put on my tinfoil hat and think that maybe she had malicious intent, but who knows? Hopefully we'll get the full story once this investigation is released, but I'm honestly not too hopeful about that. Let's see what happens. We'll give it time, but by the time there's any conclusive results about what happened, it may be too late. So now that's just one portion of the problem with the New York primary and how that benefited Hillary Clinton more than Bernie Sanders, uh, because the people who vote for Bernie Sanders Oftentimes, they don't typically vote, so if turnout is high, Bernie Sanders is going to win. So if you suppress the vote, if uh, if turnout is suppressed or limited in any way, shape, or form, that's automatically going to hurt Bernie Sanders disproportionately. Now, that's just one element, but the other element is the fact that they have this ridiculous closed primary system in New York. And I would argue that any closed primary is a form of voter suppression. When you, when you are keeping people from exercising their democratic right to vote based on their registration... I'm sorry, but that is a form of voter suppression. That's my argument. You can disagree with it, but how can you argue otherwise? I don't know at this point. Now, the problem with New York is that independents have been restricted from changing their registration to Democrats so they can vote for Bernie Sanders since October. So if you're someone who didn't even know about Bernie Sanders back then, and you didn't know you wanted to vote for him, tough. And again, many independents voted with provisional ballots and these may or may not be counted. It really depends on the outcome of the court case that's now pending. So, again, this is an open question right now, but if it is the case that these are counted, that could change things dramatically. Now, furthermore, credit to Jimmy Dore for this point, but he brought up a really great point that I wanted to share with everyone. So, New York has 3.2 million registered independents, and the vote difference between Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton is less than 300,000 votes. So if it were the case that New York was a close, wasn't a closed primary and it were open, this election would have turned out completely different. And you could even predict that Bernie Sanders could have won by a landslide if New York didn't have this arbitrary closed voting rule. So in the end, yes, Hillary Clinton, you won New York. Kudos to you. Congratulations, I guess. But this isn't a win that you really want to be proud of. This is a win that happened due to election fraud and voter suppression. That's not something you boast about or be arrogant about like your campaign has been doing. That's something that you worry about because if these type of shenanigans occur in November, if you are the nominee, guess who's going to be impacted? So the fact that Hillary Clinton and her supporters are not more worried about election fraud and voter suppression, it's honestly troubling because up until this election, that was something that Democrats all worried about. It doesn't matter if you were a right-wing Democrat, if you were a progressive, everyone worried about these voter suppression tactics like voter ID laws and whatnot. But then we have these closed primaries and we have these election shenanigans going on where they cut polling places in certain areas. And I guess it's okay because it helps Hillary Clinton. Well, you have to be consistent. You have to call out the bad tactics that limit voting when you see it because this is a democracy. So either you support democracy or you don't. That opinion of yours shouldn't vary based on the candidate that you're supporting and who it will or won't help. So that's all I got to see on this issue. I really hope that we actually get some good news out of this investigation, but I'm honestly not very hopeful at this point. At this point, we've already seen how voter suppression can have a huge impact on the outcome of elections. Arizona and New York are prime examples of this. Now, unfortunately, whenever this happens, it tends to disproportionately impact Bernie Sanders. Now, I've got bad news for you guys. So, there's already signs that voting issues will impact elections in both Rhode Island and and California. So when it comes to Rhode Island, much like Arizona, they're going to be reducing the number of polling places by 66%. Now, additionally, the locations of many polling places have been changed. So if you are expecting to show up in Rhode Island to the same polling place as you did last time, 
That may not be the case, so what I will do is put a link in the description box for all of my viewers in Rhode Island, so that way you can input your zip code and it will tell you where the nearest polling place is next to your house. And if you are listening on iTunes, you'll have to go to our YouTube page to get this link. Now, according to WPRI, only 144 of the usual 419 polling places will be open. Now, the only other time where they actually cut polling places dramatically in Rhode Island was in 2008. But even then, they reduced it down to 177 polling places, and this time they only have 144. So even though they reduced it so much in 2008, they at least had 33 more, which again, still ridiculous, but... This is the lowest they've had. Now, for example, if you live in Cumberland County, typically you'll have 13 different polling places to go to, but this time you're going to get three. So you better show up early if you're expecting to vote because if turnout is high, then the lines may get long. And as was the case in Arizona, many people ended up just leaving because they couldn't stay because either they had disabilities or they had to get back to work. So look, you have to expect the worst Polling places have been dramatically cut, so if you are planning to vote in Rhode Island, please prepare ahead of time, get there early, look up where the nearest polling place is next to you. Now, on top of all of this, the executive director for Rhode Island's Board of Elections is currently on unpaid suspension for, quote, job performance issues. So, let me just repeat this here. The individual who was literally tasked with making sure the election goes smoothly will not be there. So if there is all these long lines and problems, well, you may have no uh, recourse for that. There may be nothing you could do because their hands are tied. Now, there's already signs that there will be voting issues in California as well, unfortunately. So California is a semi-closed primary. So what that means is that you can only vote in the Democratic primary if you are registered as a Democrat or if you are registered as having no party preference. Now, the problem is that in California, they actually have a political party named the American Independent Party. Now, some people have registered for this party thinking that they're registering as independents, but in actuality, they're signing up for a right-wing, uh, anti-gay, anti-abortion party. Now, the LA Times investigated this and found out that up to 73% of voters registered within the party think they're registered as independents. So many people think that they are going to be able to vote for Bernie Sanders or Hillary Clinton when in actuality, they're going to be locked out from doing so because they are restricted to voting for someone in the conservative American Independent Party. So they explain residents of rural and urban communities, students and business owners, and top Hollywood celebrities with known Democratic leanings, including Sugar Ray Leonard, Demi Moore, and Emma Stone, were among those who believed they were declaring that they preferred no party affiliation when they checked the box for the American Independent Party. So if you are registered as an independent in California, please double check your registration, because if you're not registered as having no party preference, then you may be restricted from voting in the Democratic primary. Uh, and I will put a link in the description box that you can follow to double check if, the, if this is the case. And if you are incorrectly registered, you can also change your registration status at the link that I provide you with. Now, let me remind you that there are half a million people registered for the American Independent Party in California. And as we all know, in New York, Bernie Sanders only lost to Hillary Clinton by about 300,000 votes. So that 500,000 people could be make or break. So please, you guys have to be diligent. You have to ensure that you are registered correctly. This isn't necessarily any of their faults in California because I don't believe any state should be a semi or closed primary state. But we have to do what, uh, we have to work with what we got basically. And please double check. Links will be in the description box, but just expect to have voting issues in Rhode Island and California. But if you're in these states and you plan on voting for Bernie, you have to take the time to make sure that you can vote in the primary for Bernie Sanders or Hillary Clinton. Look, I just want democracy to happen. So people should never be restricted from voting based on how they're registered. So let's hope this goes smoothly, but you know, this is an indication that it's probably not gonna be the case. Throughout this campaign, Bernie Sanders has been consistently criticized because he has ideas that are just too big. They're pie in the sky, they're not politically feasible, they can never get through. But I've maintained that we need a president who has these big grand ideas because even if there's a 0% chance that they're going to pass, 
well, a president can still change the trajectory of the country and change the entire Democratic Party. Case in point, nobody was talking about free community college until Barack Obama brought it up at a State of the Union event. And now all of a sudden, all the other Democrats fell in line and were saying they support free community college, including Hillary Clinton. Now, the problem that I have with Hillary Clinton is that she's not even going to try. She's not even going to try to push for universal health care. She's not even going to try to push for free college education. She's just saying it's not possible, so I'm not going to do it. Well, way to dream big. I mean, in 2008, we had Obama saying anything is possible. We have hope. And now Hillary Clinton is saying, nope, can't do it. Sorry. Well, thankfully, someone agrees with me. That is Vice President Joe Biden, because he came to Bernie Sanders' defense and said we need someone who thinks big. He states, I like the idea of saying we can do much more because we can. I don't think any Democrats ever won saying we can't think that big. We ought to really downsize here because it's not realistic. Come on, man. This is the Democratic Party. I'm not part of the party that says, well, we can't do it. I completely disagree with that proposition. Everything I've ever cared about, with the exception of the president's brilliant passage of the Affordable Care Act, takes time. The only way to get these big things done is to talk about about them. So apparently everyone else in the Democratic establishment disagrees with Joe Biden because that's been the new talking point. No, we can't. We can't get this done. We can't get universal health care. We can't break up the big bangs. It's pie in the sky. So stop talking about it. Health emergencies can't wait for us to have some theoretical debate about some better idea that will never, ever come to pass. Well, Joe Biden is actually disagreeing with his establishment buddies. Now, I like everything that Joe Biden just said, with the exception of the Affordable Care Act example, because it was, one, it was right-wing policy, and second of all, you guys compromised before you even got to the negotiating table. You didn't even try to push for universal health care when you had a supermajority in the Senate, and you had a majority in the House. So, that's not the best example that you can use. But at the same time, I love the sentiment. I like that Joe Biden is coming to Bernie Sanders' defense. I want things that will dramatically impact the course of the country. And making incremental changes is not going to stop us from heading towards another economic catastrophe. Making er incremental changes is not going to bring back the middle class. So I hate this whole Hillary the pragmatist. I hate this new pragmatist Democrat that doesn't want to dream big, that doesn't want to support universal health care, that doesn't want to get money out of politics. It's really frustrating that this party completely abandoned their principles all because of Hillary Clinton. Now, I love the fact that he said nobody's ever won by saying we can't do this or that. Because that's exactly what Hillary Clinton has been trying to do. She's trying to win by saying, no, we can't get this done. How is that going to excite everyone? She talks about how all of Sanders' young supporters is going to unite behind her and coalesce around the Democratic nominee come November. But they're not excited. They're just going to stay home. Why would they get out to vote for you? You see these states like Arizona where they had to wait in line five hours. Why would they come out? and take time off of work, wait five hours in line to vote for someone who is not going to bring about actual fundamental change, which is what we need. They're just not going to do that. So the fact that you're not exciting anyone is not surprising. So now there's two last points I want to make about Joe Biden. First and foremost is that he's been kind of circling around it, but I really wish that he would just come out and endorse Bernie Sanders. That could honestly do wonders right now. And second of all, I just want you guys to think about this hypothetical scenario. If it were the case that Joe Biden run, had run, this would be an entirely different race. Bernie Sanders would have basically wrapped up the nomination because what Joe Biden would have done is he would have split the establishment vote because there are many people who are very moderate and establishment Democrats who don't necessarily like Hillary Clinton because logically... She's not the best candidate to put up against the Republican with the FBI investigation and the fact that she has such a low net favorability, even among Democratic voters. So they would have probably liked a second option if they wanted someone that wasn't, you know, revolutionary like Bernie Sanders, and they would have picked Joe Biden, and that would have split their vote, and Bernie Sanders would have had the plurality and probably would have won. So I really, really wish that Joe Biden would have stepped in the race just for my own selfish reasons, so that way Bernie Sanders would have had a better chance, and trust me, man, I, I mean, I have no way to prove this, and this is entirely speculative, but I really think Bernie Sanders would have won if Joe Biden entered the race. 
So it's frustrating that he did it, and it's frustrating that he won't just come out and endorse Bernie Sanders. Same thing with Elizabeth Warren. I mean, you have so many people who could have helped him so much. He would have won Massachusetts if Elizabeth Warren would have endorsed him. He could have won many other states if Joe Biden endorsed him early and did it just imply that he, you know, wants to endorse Bernie. We're not going to stop fighting, but I would have liked to have just an easier time <laughs> with Bernie just sweeping and winning so many more states. But again, this doesn't mean it's the end for us uh, and Bernie Sanders' campaign. We're going to fight like hell. I'm going to continue to donate to his campaign and talk about Bernie Sanders because he's the one opportunity that we have for fundamental change in the United States. I don't know when Tim Canova or John Fetterman or Alex Law is going to run for president. But in the meanwhile, we have Bernie Sanders, an opportunity to truly change the country and change the lives of so many citizens. And the Democratic Party and their voters are spoiling it so far. So don't think that this means we're giving up. But again, it just really could have been different if it were the case that other things had happened, like Joe Biden entered the race. Uh, so that's all I want to say about this. I I'm really glad that Joe Biden came to Bernie's defense because his point is it's just logical. Since Hillary Clinton won New York, the arrogance that has come out of her campaign and from her supporters has been overwhelming. So just to give you guys a few examples, Howard Dean said Bernie Sanders' rhetoric is destroying the party. And then Eric Jodkoff, a Democratic consultant for Hillary in 2008, said it's mathematically impossible for Bernie Sanders to win the Democratic nomination which is untrue. And furthermore, one unnamed Clinton aide allegedly said, quote, we kicked his ass tonight. I hope this convinces Bernie Sanders to tone it down. And if not, F him. Now, these are just a few examples of the arrogance coming from her side. Now, in spite of the condescension and the relentless smears that have come from her campaign, they still always talk about the need to unite the party. And in fact, Hillary Clinton said she actually thinks that Bernie's younger supporters will coalesce around her come November. So she states, I think I'll make the case, and from everything I've seen, both personal conversations and research that has been done, just as it was with me when I dropped out, you know, the vast majority of Senator Sanders' young supporters will look at the choice. The choice will be pretty stark if either of the two leading Republican candidates become the nominee, and I'm confident that we'll all join together. I'm sure some will, but most probably won't, Hillary. And this is because, as we've seen with young voters, they don't come out to vote unless they're enthusiastic about the candidate. This was the case in 2008 with Obama. But if they don't want to vote for a candidate or they're not excited about someone, they're not going to think, well, I guess I'm going to have to pick between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. That's not the way that it works. They'll usually just stay home. Now, this may just be anecdotal evidence, but for me, I personally know very few people who will actually vote for Hillary Clinton if she's the nominee that are younger anyways. And I did a quick poll on Twitter with my viewers and most will not be willing to vote for Hillary Clinton if she does become the nominee. And this isn't surprising to me. Most people who I talk to are Bernie Sanders through and through. They're Bernie or bust. And this is because many of them weren't even Democrats. Some were independents. Some were even Republicans who have come out to support Bernie Sanders and will not support anyone but Bernie Sanders. Now, there are two main reasons why I think Hillary Clinton will not receive the votes of younger people. I could be wrong, but this is just my reasoning. Now, first, it's because she has no policies that will excite them. Uh, and second, She's run a really dirty campaign. She's been incredibly condescending directly to young people, and even Bill Clinton has slandered young people. So when you take these two facts in mind, I just don't think they're going to come out and vote for her. Again, some will, but most won't. Now, again, when it gets to the policies, here's some of the policies that Hillary Clinton has and why we don't want to vote for her. So one, she's not adamant about getting money out of politics. Uh, she won't ban super PACs. She voted for the Iraq war. She pushed Obama for intervention in Libya. She wants a Syrian no-fly zone. She doesn't want to legalize marijuana. She only wants a $12 minimum wage. Uh, she doesn't support universal health care. She wants to prosecute Edward Snowden. She voted for the Patriot Act and its reauthorization. Uh, she doesn't want to break up the big bank. She is in support of the death penalty. She supported the Wall Street bailout. Her stance on the Israel-Palestine conflict is extreme. I mean, there's so many reasons why we don't want to support Hillary Clinton. She has no policy position that is innovative or encouraging or inspiring. Look at her college tuition plan. It's literally the same thing we have right now. You can do work-study programs to get your tuition paid for. 
It's nothing new that she's proposing. She's just stating that she's going to maintain the status quo. Obama already made it so that way you can't pay more than 10% of your income on your student loans. So she's not proposing anything new and she expects us to be super excited about her. Now, as for my second point, she ran one of the dirtiest campaigns I've ever seen. She accused Bernie Sanders of being sexist, of being racist, of not being a true Democrat. Uh, and furthermore, she said that we don't do our research. We believe Bernie Sanders lies because we don't do our research. No, we've done our research and that's why we don't support you. And additionally, Bill Clinton recently just suggested that Bernie Sanders supporters are so extreme that we actually want to do violence against Wall Street, which is just a way to paint Bernie Sanders and his supporters as delusional, as extremists. And furthermore, Bill Clinton compared us to the Tea Party. And this has been a consistent theme throughout her campaign. They've effectively done everything that they can to get us to not vote for them. So now all of a sudden that it looks as though she's probably going to clench the nomination. All of a sudden she wants to play nice. She wants to unite the party. No, thank you. Uh, if you want us to vote for you, well, what you're going to need to do is purchase a time machine and go back in time and actually make us trust you. Don't take money from a special interest. Don't give speeches to Goldman Sachs and then refuse to release those transcripts. Now again, I'm sure some of Bernie Sanders supporters will go over and support Hillary Clinton. But unfortunately for you, it's too late, Hillary. You have run a dirty smear campaign where you smear not just your opponent, but his supporters. And that is, it's a politics 101. You don't do that. You don't smear people who you expect to vote for you come November. It's just not a smart tactic. How many times has Bernie Sanders smeared Hillary Clinton's supporters? Zero times. Because he's smart. He knows that if he becomes the nominee, he's going to need their vote in November. So the fact that she actually thinks that people are going to coalesce around her in November, especially younger people who don't come out to vote unless they're excited about candidates. I've got news for you, Hillary. If you want the votes of young people, you have to earn their votes. But unfortunately for you, it's probably too late for that. Ted Cruz recently sent out a campaign fundraising email wherein he talks about all of the sacrifices he's made to run for president. And I'll read you that email, but what I really want to get to is Elizabeth Warren, who responded randomly to this, and she just decided to demolish Ted Cruz. So we'll get to that email, and then I'll tell you what Elizabeth Warren had to say. Ted Cruz writes, You see, running for president of the United States is a significant sacrifice. Only by the grace of God and with unwavering help from my wonderful supporters like you have we reached this point on the verge of capturing the Republican nomination. Yeah, right. You're nowhere near it, buddy. And while I'm on the verge of victory, I need to share something with you. The sacrifices for our campaign are steep, but I'm proud to be making them on your behalf. The constant attacks never stop. The liberal media, Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, know the best way to defeat me and score another win for the Washington cartel is to tear me down. I face the constant barrage of political and personal attacks daily. Time with my family is non-existent. Spending almost every day on the campaign trail means precious little time spent with my wife, Heidi, and my daughters, the very family that gives me the motivation and drive to fight. Health and sleep are limited. Fighting morning and night for the future of our country ensures long nights and early mornings, resulting in little to no sleep. Personal time is not possible. You think of this the least, but as a candidate, my days are no longer my own. Days start before dawn and many times don't end until early the next morning. There's almost no personal time when you run for president. Friend, let me be clear. I'm willing to make these sacrifices despite the high cost. So I have so much to say about this, but I'm going to get to Elizabeth Warren's response because I think she did a better job at saying everything that I wanted. And she says, are you kidding me, Ted Cruz? We're supposed to pity you because trying to be the leader of the free world is hard. Two words, boo-hoo. All right, so far, Elizabeth Warren has no chill, but I love it. Uh, know, know whose health is limited? Workers with no paid leave who can't stay home when sick or caring for their kids. Ted Cruz won't support it which is true. Uh, know those whose sleep is limited. Working parents who stay up worrying about getting kids through college without big debt. Ted Cruz blocked refi. So refinancing uh, student loans and allowing students to do that is what she's talking about. Um, she also says, know who gets no personal time? People who work two minimum wage jobs to support their families. Ted Cruz opposes giving them a raise. So she's going to town on him. There, there's a ton of tweets. Know who gets no family time? Ted Cruz? Moms with unfair schedules who drop kids at daycare and find their hours canceled. GOP won't help. Know who's facing constant attacks, Ted Cruz? 
hardworking American immigrants, Muslims, LGBT folks, women, your constant attacks. And Ted Cruz, working people work more, get paid less, can't save, get mistreated, struggle with illness and family, but they don't whine. They don't throw tantrums or try to shut down their workplace because they don't get their way. And they turn and then turn around and demand promotions. You chose to run for president, Ted Cruz. You chose to make your sacrifices. Working people don't have a choice. Hey, Ted Cruz, maybe you should spend less time complaining about your significant sacrifices and more time doing something about theirs. So any and everything I wanted to say, she said, I was like, when I, when I heard about this, I was going to straight go in for all of the same talking points. Just the whole, well, working people don't get the choice. You chose to make the sacrifice. And she hit on every point that I wanted to make. And do you want to know his response, Elizabeth Warren? Nothing. Because he can't respond to this. How do you respond to that? You have a rich oligarch who is bankrolled by billionaires complaining about running for president and how he doesn't have time to do anything. Right. Well, nobody forced you to run for president except for your God, who you claim encouraged you to run. But nobody's forcing you to run. You can drop out at any time and you probably should since you're not going to win anyway. But I like to think that he would find sympathy among people. And it's, it's the Republicans who are always saying, get a job. You're lazy. Do hard work. Work hard and you'll succeed. And we have Ted Cruz right here <laughs> being a little whiny baby about how difficult it is to run for president. Oh, I'm, I'm crying. I'm shedding so many tears for you. This is the smallest violin in the world that I'm going to play for you, Ted Cruz. So I love Elizabeth Warren's response. Uh, I thought it was great. Uh, my only thing is Elizabeth Warren, please endorse Bernie Sanders. That was random, but you know, I had to throw that in. But in the end, Ted Cruz is feeling the burn from Warren. <laughs> Recently, Donald Trump was asked whether or not transgender people should be given the right to use the bathroom as the gender they identify with, and he actually had a surprisingly reasonable answer. So he said, North Carolina did something that was very strong, and they're paying a big price. There's a lot of problems. Leave it the way it is. North Carolina, what they're going through with all the business that's leaving, all of the strife, and this is on both sides, leave it the way it is. There have been very few complaints the way it is. People go, they use the bathroom that they feel is appropriate. There has been so little trouble. And the problem with what happened in North Carolina is the strife and the economic, I mean, the economic punishment that they're taking. You know, there's a big move to create new bathrooms. Problem with that is for transgender, that would be, first of all, I think that would be discriminatory in a certain way. That would be unbelievably expensive for businesses in the country. Leave it the way it is. Okay, so that was a surprisingly reasonable answer. So, kudos to you, Donald Trump. I mean, we already know that he's no LGBT ally. He's against marriage equality. He already stated that he would appoint homophobic Supreme Court justices to overturn the marriage equality ruling. But I mean, hey, credit where credit is due. This is progress. This is a step in the right direction. So, you get three claps and that's it, Donald. Sorry. <laughs> if you want applause... You got to go even further and actually go where young Republicans are headed, which is towards accepting LGBT rights. Now, of course, since Donald Trump had uh, decided to be reasonable on this issue, Ted Cruz decided to attack him for it. And he launched this ad about Donald Trump. Kurt Schilling was fired by the PC police for suggesting that grown men shouldn't use the bathroom with little girls. Guess who's joined the ranks of the PC police? People go, they use the bathroom that they feel is appropriate. Donald Trump can't be trusted with common sense. Why would we trust him in the White House? So unsurprisingly, Ted Cruz thought the reception to this video would be so great that he decided to disable likes, dislikes, and comments on it. So you already know uh, <laughs> why he decided to do that. But here's the thing. Ted Cruz is making a straw man argument about Donald Trump's position and the position of people who are reasonable on this issue. He's saying that if you want transgender people to be able to use the bathroom as the gender they identify as, you're going to effectively allow grown men to use the bathroom with little girls. So what's the underlying implication here? Well, men are going to start putting on dresses and wigs and they're going to be perverts. They're pedophiles. They're going to go in there and peep on little girls. That's what they're saying. That's the implication. Okay, he's not saying it, but that's the implication over here. But that's totally incorrect. Ted Cruz can't point to one instance where there's a problem. 
okay? There's been complaints about how one transphobic woman feels uncomfortable, but there's never actually been any instances of abuse or rape or assault from a transgender person just using the bathroom. Like everyone else, they go in the bathroom to use the bathroom. I don't think that uh, they would go through all the trouble to change their gender just to peep on people in the bathroom. There's other ways to be a creep, and that's not one of them. There's probably easier ways for them to be a creep. Now, here's the thing that's ironic, that Ted Cruz can't get through his thick skull. He doesn't realize that if he actually doesn't want men using the bathroom of little girls, that he should stop pushing these anti-trans bills, because this bill that they have in North Carolina, that's going to do just what Ted Cruz says he doesn't want to happen. It's going to force men to use the bathroom with little girls. So case in point, here's some pictures that a transgender man has taken to illustrate the absurdity of these bathroom bills. Does that look like an individual who should be using the women's bathroom? I don't think so. Now, here's a transgender woman who was forced to use a men's bathroom. So if Ted Cruz actually doesn't want men to use the bathroom with little girls, stop pushing these transphobic bills because it's going to do just that, what you don't want to happen. There is no signs of abuse, no perversion going on. It's just people going to the bathroom as the gender they identify with. It's really simple, it's straightforward, but for some reason, Ted Cruz can't get that. Now, Ted Cruz is someone who is overtly homophobic and transphobic. This is a presidential candidate who literally spoke at an event where a pastor advocated for killing gay people. He came on stage after that pastor said gay should be put to death. And furthermore, Ted Cruz is anti-gay, anti-trans, just to appease his right-wing extremist evangelical base. But here's the thing about Ted Cruz that he doesn't get. See, if you're overly anti-gay, if you're overly transphobic, then that doesn't throw people off the scent, because let's be honest, what I'm going to say is probably not politically correct. He's probably a closeted homosexual. <laughs> and if that's not a definite, then it's a high probability, in my opinion. And I've got two words for those who disagree. Ted Haggard. So we don't have to debate about what we should think about homosexual activity. It's written in the Bible. So it's those people who are the most homophobic, the most transphobic, that end up being the biggest homos and having the most skeletons in their closet. So if Ted Cruz really wants to throw people off his scent, then he should be more accepting of gay and trans people. Because the more anti-gay you are, the more we suspect Ted Cruz, and you are a prime candidate for suspicion. So overall, though, I, again, I want to get back to Donald Trump. I'm just surprised that Donald Trump took a reasonable stance on this. Now, again, I'm not unequivocally against Donald Trump. He takes a reasonable stance on many issues. For example, um, he chose to remain relatively neutral on the Israel-Palestine conflict. Uh, he's against these bad free trade deals, and he claims that he will not allow people to die in the country if they don't have health care. He also said he wants to tax the rich recently. So Donald Trump is not 100% bad, but he does have a lot of unforgivable stances, such as killing civilians and whatnot, and uh, deporting all 11 million undocumented immigrants. But again, credit where credit is due. Uh, if you're right on the issue, you're right on the issue. It doesn't matter who you are. So kudos to Donald Trump to, uh, for coming around on this. And Ted Cruz should be ashamed of himself. This guy is just repulsive. 300,000 religious congregations in this country that pay no tax, no federal, state, or local, no income, sales, or property tax, and they own $600 billion in property, like St. Patrick's Cathedral on Fifth Avenue in New York. If you sell cheap sweaters like they do across the street at Forever 21, you pay taxes. But if you're selling the invisible product of eternal whatever, no taxes. So to recap, Forever 21, taxes. Forever 33, no taxes. <laughs> you know, Scientology founder L. Ron Hubbard once said that the only way to make any real money in this world was to start a religion. And even though the one he started only has about 30,000 members, it owns billions in real estate tax scot free, and that makes me hopping mad. <laughs> the Supreme Court of the United States really needs to take a case about taxing churches because it hasn't done that since 1970. And since then, religion has become much less popular, especially with younger people. <laughs> To them, 
religion is the new pubic hair. Thirty-five percent of millennials want nothing to do with it, and the rest worship an ancient Jew born over 2,000 years ago, Bernie Sanders. <laughs> and it's not just millennials, my flock. The atheists, agnostics, and anti-religionists out there are now the second biggest denomination in America. Right behind evangelicals, we're 22.8%. That means almost a quarter of us in America are being forced to subsidize a myth that we're not buying into. Why am I subsidizing their Sunday morning hobby? They don't subsidize mine. So this right here, in my opinion, is Bill Maher at his 100% best. So if you exempt churches from paying their taxes, well, then you're giving them a privilege that non-religious organizations don't have. And I think that's unfair, and it's not giving all organizations and entities equal protection under the law. Now, just to give you a taste of how profitable some of these mega churches are, we have Kenneth Copeland, who has a net worth of $760 million. He's almost a billionaire. Now, furthermore, we have Rick Warren, $25 million. Uh, John Hagee, net worth of $5 million. And you know him and his son both preach homophobia day in and day out. Furthermore, Pat Robertson, net worth of $100 million. Billy Graham, net worth of $25 million. Benny Hinn, $42 million. This is the guy that literally will uh, put his hand on people and they'll fall down and start like freaking out. <laughs> Even when my family was religious, we already knew this, this is bullshit. Who believes this? So the fact that he's a, a multi-millionaire and his net worth is $42 million blows my mind and just proves that people will believe anything. And a couple more. Joel Osteen, $40 million is his net worth. And then we have Creflo Dollar, $27 million. So now in theory, there are non-religious people who don't mind subsidizing the tax-exempt status of churches. Now, this is because, in theory, churches provide a social good. So, in their communities, they uh, provide people with clothing banks and food banks and do charitable work. But there's a counter-argument to that, in my opinion, that's pretty persuasive. So, if you actually tax churches, then you could increase the social good that much more. So, by not taxing churches, you leave what they do in their own hands. So, for example, my old church, when I was religious, you could only get their charity services if you actually were a member of the church. And so, if you didn't go to their church, sorry, you're out of luck. It was very rare that they would help someone in the community just for the sake of doing so. But if you tax them, you could put that money towards, I believe, a larger social good, strengthen our social safety net, so that way everyone, doesn't matter if you're religious or non-religious, can get help. So you could do a lot better for the world if you actually do tax these organizations. Now, there's also a constitutional argument in favor of taxing churches. First and foremost, it violates the separation of church and state uh, because it provides a financial benefit to these religious organizations and it doesn't give that same privilege to secular organizations. And that's not fair. Now, furthermore, in Waltz v. Tax Commission of the City of New York, Justice Douglas said it best. He said, if believers are entitled to a public financial support, so are non-believers. A believer and non-believer under the present law are treated differently because of the articles of their faith. I conclude that this tax exemption is unconstitutional. Now, furthermore, it is not a right for churches to be tax exempt. This is just a privilege. That's how it's viewed under the law. And additionally, another way how churches are treated better than just standard nonprofit organizations who do charitable work is that these nonprofit organizations, every single year, they have to file an IRS form, uh, tax form 990, I believe it is. And what they have to do is just, they have to file and renew their tax exempt status each year. But churches, on the other hand, they don't even have to file their federal taxes. They don't have to file a tax form 990. They just get to get away with being tax exempt every single year. Here. Now, furthermore, in 1954, there was a law that was passed that banned churches from being politically active. And a problem is that many churches are violating this law. 
and they go unpunished for this in many instances. So you saw with the uh, Mormon church and how they pushed for Proposition 8 in California to ban marriage equality. You see all the time in different states, uh, church organizations pushing these anti-transgender bathroom bills. And this is the definition of political activity. So if churches are treated better than other nonprofit and charitable organizations, if they often break the law, if they have privileges that other businesses, yes, churches are businesses because they make a profit, if they're treated better and are more privileged than other businesses who are not religious, well then that violates equal protection under the law. You can't do that. You can't treat secular people different than religious people. So for that reason, we got to tax churches. It's just a constitutionally sound argument, and it's also what's ethical. It's time we tax churches, take that money, put it towards the social good, because we can't rely on churches to do the right thing. We can use that money to fund universal health care, universal education, to actually help everyone and not just religious people. Well, that's the episode. I want to thank all of my subscribers for tuning in. I want to thank all of the patrons we have on Patreon, all of the members, all of the donators who make this podcast possible. And I want to welcome all of my newest viewers and subscribers and listeners on iTunes now to the channel. So as you may have noticed, uh, we have our first big upgrade to the studio. Uh, and I am super excited. Uh, this has been a long time in the making. Uh, but we have a new microphone. Uh, it's not entirely tuned yet. Uh, I'm still going to be trying to adjust the audio and make it more clear. But, I mean, this is a lot better than the other one that I had where there was a constant, uh, like, a buzzing sound in it that was just obnoxious. Uh, but this, everything is so much better. If you look back to the very first episode, it was a, a train wreck in terms of technical difficulties, in terms of just everything. And to see how far we've come now, uh, going almost a year strong, and now at 35,000 subscribers... Man, I, I'm overwhelmed. This is awesome. So let me just go through because all of this that you see has been paid for by our members. So I'm actually putting your money to good use if you have donated to us on uh, Patreon or if you signed up on humanistreport.com or if you just sent us a donation. It's all going into improving the podcast. Now, there's a lot of things that you don't see behind the scenes. So for example, I have a bigger memory card, so I could actually film longer videos, and I could do longer interviews with my actual camera, not my crappy webcam. Uh, and furthermore, uh, I bought two new batteries. I used to be limited to filming in about 40 to 45 minutes because my battery would die and it would take hours and hours to charge. Uh, and now I have more batteries. Uh, now what the camera sits on is a tripod that isn't going to fall apart at any moment. And of course, we have the new microphone. Uh, and this is what all the pros use. You know, you see the same one on ESPN, the David Packman show. So I'm really stoked. It's like a real podcast now, even though this is just, you know, I set this up in my home studio, you know, in my computer office where I do my homework and stuff. It, it, it's, it looks like a real studio. We look legit now, and I'm super stoked. So I have all these people to thank, so I'm going to thank you if you've ever donated or if you are a member. So first and foremost, we have all of our donors, Chen Chen, Gordon Bibby, John Bru uh, Bruch. Uh, we have Kay, we had Nanad Nesvik, uh, Nicholas Cole, and Thai Ruos. Those are all the people who donated to us. We also have our THR members, uh, Charles and Solo, Elsine Perez, Evan Spadoni, Gold Wolf, Judith Silverstein, Justin Mills, Patrick Wong, Shane Dean. Uh, and additionally, we have all of our Patreon patrons, Abanu Strickland, uh, Angelo Masisco, Belen Lazaro, Haley Foster, Hillary James Boyle, Jimmy Jimenez, Katie Sharko, Kristen Bean, or Kirsten Beam, sorry, uh, Kareen Cole, Neo Tendar, Nikki Sonriser, Pedro Galindo, Raphael Teeling, Robbie Ruth Singleton, and Swami Amala. Every single one of you guys are awesome and i have to give a special thank you again to jimmy j swami a thai ruos k and john brulage um or bruchley sorry i'm probably butchering some of your guys names but if you go to humanistreport.com support um you can see all of their names there and if i've missed anyone or if i don't have your twitter handle displayed then please uh, reach out to me mike at humanistreport.com and i can fix that for you um but without you guys this wouldn't be possible. So I wasn't going to be able to pay for the tech upgrades for a while, I was thinking. But uh, thankfully, 
This show is member supported through and through, and you guys made this all possible. So uh, thank you all so much. I'm really stoked. And this is just one of many upgrades and expansions that we're going to do because I think Humus Report is going to blow up, hopefully. Uh, we'll see. Knock on wood because we don't know what's going to happen after the election if all my viewers leave. But in the end, I just wanted to share with you, uh, you know, the new upgrades to the set. Hopefully the audio quality is a lot better. Hopefully you enjoy the new look of the set. Uh, so yeah, just had to share that. Um, hope you guys like it. So I'll see you next week.